All right, well, I'm Sophie, uh, and as we said, I'll be talking about glaciers and ice that's, uh, around our solar system. Uh, and this is one of my favorite pictures uh, from the solar system. It's actually a picture of Pluto, and you can see it's a really nice blue atmosphere here. Um, and before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to the organizers of the night. I know it's quite difficult to get everything up and running online, but I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm really excited to talk today. Uh, also, thanks to everyone for joining. I know I have some uh, friends and family uh, on the East Coast that are joining, so uh, thanks for that. Um, so just a, a quick introduction um, about myself. Come on, slides. Oh, there we go. Uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so I am a PhD candidate at UT Austin, so I'm a graduate student. Uh, my background is in geology, so I studied at the University of Buffalo uh, up in up in New York. Uh, and currently my thesis work is in studying glaciers in Greenland using satellite data. So I am a terrestrial glaciologist, so I study the earth mainly. Uh, but I have a lot of interest in um, ice and space uh, from undergraduate research that I've done and, and just a general interest. So uh, that's mainly what I'll be talking about today. Um, so, you know, this is our uh, classic view of the solar system with our eight planets and everyone's favorite dwarf planet Pluto. Um, and today we're going to take a virtual journey using Twitch and PowerPoint uh, to the icy bodies within our planetary neighborhood. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to hit up every single body, every single piece of ice in our solar system. We're going to stick mainly to our planets and a couple moons. Um, but, uh, you know, someone can write textbooks on this stuff. Um, and so as many journeys start, we're going to begin uh, at our home, uh, which is Earth. Uh, this is our blue and green and white planet we all know and love. Uh, and much of what we understand about ice and glacier, glaciers naturally comes from Earth because it's our, you know, it's our natural laboratory. It's in our backyards. Um, and, you know, even from this picture, you can see the South Pole. You can see Antarctica. It's beautiful icy cap. And a lot of these clouds that are circulating bring precipitation throughout the globe. Um, and there are a multitude of reasons why we want to understand ice on Earth. Uh, one of these is that... 10% of the Earth is actually covered in glacial ice. So it's a, a massive amount of ice. Uh, and that 10% of glacial ice stores 68% of the Earth's freshwater. Um, and this makes it the largest freshwater reserve on the planet. Uh, so we want to conserve our freshwater and we want to understand where it is, uh, how it's going to change in the future. And a lot of people actually rely on uh, glaciers as their freshwater source. So it's really important that we, uh, we study these guys. Um, this uh, glacial ice comes in many forms throughout our planet. Um, so, for example, we have tidewater glaciers here, beautiful tidewater glaciers, and they drain from ice sheets and produce really large icebergs that can be as big as cities. Um, and pictured here uh, is an image from Kangaroosack Glacier. Uh, we can see the ice, and Greenland ice sheet is uh, way back uh, in the horizon <laughs> there. Uh, connected to the ocean, uh, and it produces uh, icebergs as it calves out and uh, makes these really beautiful shapes. Um, and right here is a still from a video from Chasing Ice uh, showing Jakobshavn Glacier, and that is Lower Manhattan overlaying on that glacier. Um, and if I had the video included in here, there would have been as much ice lost in about a two-hour time period as the size of Lower Manhattan. So um, it's, pretty, it's pretty massive. Uh, we also have beautiful ice shelves that are these floating sheets of ice that flow into the ocean in these really large plains. Um, and they're fed by land ice from places like uh, Antarctica here, and every color uh, is one of these ice shelves. Um, and these also produce really large icebergs, and you might have even seen this picture in the news of this really odd and nearly perfectly square-shaped one. Uh, we also have mountain glaciers. Um, so in areas like Alaska or in the Alps, we see these weird and beautiful mountain glaciers. So uh, for example, this is, uh, uh, all of these pictures are from Alaska, but this one here shows Malaspina Glacier, um, pictured as it spills out onto the coast to make this really interesting lobate uh, apron shape. Um, and it gets precariously close to the ocean. Um, we also have mountain glaciers that produce really interesting uh, patterns on their edge and through, uh, through banding um, from the incorporation of the mountains that they're scraping up from the flow of the ice. Uh, 
there's even glaciers like this, Sourdough Rock Glacier uh, in the uh, Wrangell St. Elias Mountains. Um, and it's a rock covered debris glacier. Um, and it's actually cored with ice, so there's a lot of ice in, underneath this, but uh, it's covered in debris and that protects it from the elements. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these glaciers can be found all over the world, but a lot of this ice is trapped up in our poles, uh, like in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Uh, and these ice sheets have gotten a lot of uh, press, a lot of scientific research put into them because of what they can tell us about past climate and what current climate is doing to change them. So first, we know a lot about past climate from sampling ice sheets with ice cores and radar surveys. So pictured on the left here is uh, just a segment, about a 19 centimeter segment from an ice core, and that shows seasonal uh, cycles of ice formation from, uh, from an ice sheet and glaciers. Scientists can sample this ice to get the chemical composition of the air that's trapped within the ice, uh, and then we can take that and extrapolate it to the rest of the ice sheet using radar surveys. Uh, so this um, uh, picture shown here, <laughs> is a cartoon of one of those surveys where radar has actually gone through and mapped internal reflections with an ice sheet so we can get um, dates. We also care about these large ice sheets because of mass loss and sea level rise. So this video on the left is of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and so we have more uh, mass loss is going to be darker red and yellow will be less. Um, and this graph on the right is actually tracking that ice loss on the y-axis in gigatons and time since 2002 on the x-axis. So this data is actually from uh, gravity surveys from the GRACE satellite. Um, and other studies uh, have actually shown us that the ice sheet has been losing uh, mass since the 1980s. Um, so this is a, a really important uh, reason to study these uh, ice sheets because of our own impact on our climate. Um, and apart from major impact on climate, glaciers are home to a lot of things like really cute penguins and polar bears uh, in the Arctic, and even uh, these kind of creepy looking ice worms uh, and algae that makes this really cool watermelon ice. So it's a really harsh environment, but there's a lot of life there. Um, on top of that, there's uh, approximately 13.1 uh, million people living in the circumpolar north in order over 40 ethnic groups, over a lot of indigenous people there. And they use the ice sheets and sea ice areas for their um, sustenance hunting, farming. Um, and so protecting the Arctic uh, is also gonna protect these people. But you guys didn't come here to just hear me talk about the Earth. Uh, so we're gonna take a trip to Earth's closest neighbor, uh, the moon. So this is the moon, beautifully clear, cratered, subject of many poems, stories, uh, and the possibility of ice actually being on the floors of lunar craters was suggested in the 60s. Um, and in, I think, 2018, NASA's Moon Mineralogy Mapper um, was able to uh, actually uh, confirm the presence of, of water ice at the uh, poles of the moon. And so shown here, uh, blue is representing the ice locations, plotted over an image of the lunar surface where darker colors are going to be colder, lighter is going to be warmer. And so the ice is concentrated in this darkest and coldest locations, which is actually the shadows of these craters that never see the sun. Um, and now zooming back out, we're going to go on to uh, a planet that I originally thought would be the least likely to have ice. Um, and that's going to be Mercury, the planet that's closest to the sun. Um, now, Mercury isn't the hottest planet that uh, that prize goes to um, Venus, but um, we also see that water ice can exist um, in a similar manner to the moon in depressed regions at the poles of Mercury, so in permanently shadowed craters that never see the sun. So in this map, uh, yellow craters mark locations that um, could show evidence for water ice uh, detected by Earth-based radar observations. Um, and uh, later, Messenger was able to actually uh, image these deposits. So there's a, a good potential that we can see ice, uh, water ice on, on Mercury. Okay, and now we're going to move on to the red planet, Mars, with its uh, beautiful ice caps and dark red dust. Mars's temperature is uh, generally a lot colder than the Earth, so much of it can actually exist below the temperature that ice freezes. So we have here ice freezes and, and uh, where Mars exists at. 
However, the atmosphere is uh, much thinner than Earth. So, uh, you know, therefore liquid water is not going to be stable on the surface of the ice uh, of the planet. And ice is not going to be stable except um, at the poles uh, where it's really, really cold or uh, where it's buried and protected. The uh, North Polar Layer Deposit, uh, also known as the NPLD, and uh, in, in obviously the north of Mars, <laughs> is made up of mostly water ice and CO2 ice, and it's layered with sand and dust. So it's sand, dust, ice layers. Um, it's about two miles thick and approximately 600 miles across. It's, it's pretty massive. Um, so this uh, uh, NPLD um, also has these really interesting layers uh, that we can see. So the layers on the NPLD could potentially tell us something about past climate on Mars in the same way that it does on Earth. So this is a high resolution image of one of those layers showing that when the NPLD um, forms these uh, dust and ice layers, the variation in this could uh, record fluctuations in Martian climate. So when we have times that it's really dusty or we have times that it's really icy. Um, and if we can translate that record like that we do on Earth, it could give us really valuable insights into uh, Mars's past climate. Uh, and while we don't really have the ability to get ice cores from the NPLD right now, we do have an orbital radar uh, that can be used to observe the structure of the NPLD. So this is a, an image of the, uh, the uh, NPLD, and uh, above it is a, a radar survey that's actually cutting through uh, this layer, and we can see the internal reflectors there of, of these uh, layers. Uh, I also have to note that Mars does have a southern polar cap, but it's far smaller than uh, the NPLD. It's about 250 miles across. Um, and uh, similarly, both, both Mars polar caps are a combination of water ice and carbon dioxide ice. Um, and as the Martian seasons changes over, over the year, carbon dioxide can vaporize in the summer, and then it freezes again in the winter, so there's some growth. Mars also has these really interesting viscous flow features uh, shown in this picture here. Um, and this is what's known as a low bay debris apron and it exists in the mid latitudes on Mars. Uh, so it's away from the poles where ice would be, uh, ice normally isn't gonna be stable at the surface, but it, it's, it's covered in debris. And if we take a look at this picture, if you uh, uh, remember me, a sourdough rock glacier in Alaska, uh, radar studies on Mars uh, ha have shown that uh, aprons like this are very similar to the debris covered glaciers that we see on Earth. So there's an icy core in both of these, uh, and it's covered by meters of debris. And, and the folded surface textures on both of these glaciers are caused by the flow of ice. And people have mapped these features and other, other features that have these similar flow patterns on them in the mad latitudes of Mars, and there's, there's thousands. Um, and, and so buried ice on the mid-latitudes of Mars is not just interesting for past climate, but if we look at a future that looks something like this one, uh, and this is, of course, from the show The Expanse, which um, I highly recommend to you if you haven't seen it, but you're a bunch of nerds, so I'm sure a lot of you have already seen The Expanse. Um, <laughs> but uh, so this is Mars, and, we, and you know, there's people living on it, and if we want people to live there, you're going to need water. Uh, and these debris-covered glaciers that are cored with ice water uh, could potentially be the answer to that question. All right, thank you, Mars. Now we're going to move away from the inner solar system and take a look at a moon of Jupiter that's really important for the study of ice in our solar system, uh, and that's Europa. So Europa is a little bit smaller than Earth's moons, but it's really, really interesting. Its surface is, is mostly water ice, and it's crisscrossed by these really long cracks, ridges, bands, these linear fractures. Uh, and scientists think that these are, are most likely produced by uh, warm ice, uh, eruptions of warm ice um, through this icy crust uh, and spread open to expose warmer layers below. Um, so it's kind of like a similar effect to what we see at, at spreading ridges on Earth. Um, and the reddish color could uh, be from uh, salts, magnesium salts, or other organic materials that could be present on this uh, little body. Uh, and scientists think that this spreading is actually caused by a salty global ocean that is almost certainly hidden beneath this uh, really thick icy crust uh, pictured here. Um, and this ocean might even be so massive that it could contain twice as much water as all of Earth's oceans combined, which is pretty incredible. And so this circulating ocean may be the perfect place for life to thrive where there's a lot of 
salty water and energy. Uh, and actually the Europa Clipper mission, uh, its goal is to allow scientists to investigate the chemical makeup and structure of Europa to see if life could actually exist here. All right, next up is a moon of Saturn that we're interested in for very similar reasons as Europa, it was Enceladus, which I think is a little bit prettier than Europa, but that's just my opinion. Um, and so, like Europa, Enceladus probably has an icy crust uh, and a global ocean, uh, but uh, also a rocky core. Uh, and there's also these really cool active jets or plumes on the south pole of Enceladus uh, that we um, are, are pictured here in this art. But um, these plumes were actually imaged by Cassini um, in the <coughs> past decade, excuse me. And Cassini is able to sample these plumes and show that they're actually over about 90% water. Um, and Cassini, uh, Rip, uh, plummeted into the atmosphere of Saturn to protect moons like Enceladus from contamination from us humans because uh, we don't want to uh, contaminate uh, anything that might have the potential for life. So I died for the good of science. Uh, and I really, really like these pictures, especially this top left one because it kind of looks like Enceladus is blasting off into space. Um, it's not, but that is cool. Uh, and of course, I would be remiss if I did not mention the poster children for icy planets in our solar system, the lonely ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Um, so these planets are mostly made up of water, methane, ammonia. They have really thick dynamic atmospheres, absolutely beautiful blue colors. Um, but we really don't know too much about them uh, because the only spacecraft to actually visit them was Voyager um, in the 80s. Uh, so they are, they are truly very lonely, but they're very pretty to look at. Um, and last but certainly not least, my favorite dwarf planet, Pluto. Um, Pluto was at the start of my talk. It's my background right now. It's definitely my favorite dwarf planet, and hopefully we'll be after this. <laughs> uh, I encourage everyone to just Google pictures of Pluto. It's, it's really incredible uh, because Pluto was actually visited by New Horizons in 2015. Uh, and so this is a, a beautiful false color image uh, of this little dwarf planet showing us that it's far more interesting than we ever really thought. Um, I um, remember being in school, learning about Pluto, thinking it was just kind of boring. It was just the, the smallest planet. And now I think it's one of the most uh, incredible things that we've learned about uh, in, in recent history. Uh, so ice on Pluto is really interesting. So Pluto has this really massive heart-shaped depression, um, this massive glacier that's made up of solid nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane ice. Uh, and it's known as Sputnik Bonham. And it's actually the size of Oklahoma and Texas combined. So it's, it's really massive. Um, and we can see uh, from this zoom in image here, all these uh, really interesting flowy features. So uh, there's flowing glaciers from the rugged uplands here. Uh, we can see cellular terrain, which is potentially caused from circulation that's happening uh, within this glacier. Uh, hill clusters, which is actually blocks of floating ice uh, within this nitrogen glacier. Uh, so absolutely stunning. Um, and if we look at these rugged uplands that uh, surround, uh, <coughs> excuse me, surround Sputnik Planum, these are actually uh, massive mountains that can be over 10 to 11,000 feet tall in some areas. And Pluto is so cold that water ice actually acts as a rock to form these mountains. So uh, I really like this perspective view of Pluto's highest mountain, Tenzing Montes. Uh, and uh, this is a really nice uh, to scale, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, image of these uh, water ice mountains. And so in this picture, which was uh, made by James Total Keen, so he's a, a, a planetary scientist, but he's also an artist. He draws these um, pictures at conferences to explain concepts in really beautiful ways. And he shows us how scientists actually think that part on Pluto form. So, uh, there was probably some sort of impact that formed a massive crater on the surface. Um, and then nitrogen ice and, and methane ice that was uh, present in these water ice fountains actually flowed out into that mountain and uh, uh, flowed out into that depression, creating splendid quantum. Um, and while studying Pluto is just massively cool, it's just really pretty to look at, um, it's actually way more important than that because when we look at the rest of the galaxy, the other solar systems, um, we find that 
Pluto-like worlds are far more common than Earth-like ones. So if you want to understand places outside of our home system, Pluto's a really, uh, a really good place to start. Um, and we've got some cool data for it as well. Um, so hopefully today you've seen some beautiful images of ice uh, in our solar system. I have a little bit of perspective on why we care about ice on Earth and maybe a little bit in the solar system. Um, so with that, I'll leave some time for questions. Uh, I put up my email uh, in case anyone uh, does get their question answered or I'm not able to answer your question today. Like I said, I'm, I'm an Earth glaciologist, but I have plenty of, of friends that are experts uh, on ice on other planetary bodies. Uh, and I would be happy to share questions that you have for me with them if I can't answer them today. Um, and my Twitter handle is up as well. And uh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sophie. Wow, what a, what a great talk. And we have some, some questions for you. Um, great. Yeah, I, I thought your talk was great personally. I, thank you. <laughs> I, I, it's so... Uh, wonderful that, that you like Pluto so much. I, I learned probably more about Pluto than I ever knew just from those three slides. <laughs> I love the names, by the way, the, um, the, the, like the Tenzing Montes, the tallest mountains on Pluto, named mm -hmm. after the first person to, to mount the tallest uh, mountain on, on Earth. That's yeah, I actually have one more slide that I added later today because I was like, oh, it's a bunch of nerds. <laughs> uh, Pluto's moon, which it, Pluto's in a binary system, has this moon, Sharon. Mm -hmm. uh, its naming scheme is basically sci-fi and fantasy names. So like this picture here has Vulcan Planum and there's oh, Spock Crater, yeah. Kubik Ron, Sulu Crater. It's, <laughs> it's like a nerd's dream. Oh, the the right. team of New Horizons actually put, like wanted that. That was unofficial for a while and that's just, they needed names so they could talk about mm -hmm. the geology. Uh, and then it you know, got accepted. Uh, and my, I like Skywalker Crater and Organic Crater and Vader Crater. They're, those huh? three are actually identical, very identical craters, but one of them has more ammonia, one of them has less, so it looks like a little different in different spectroscopy fields. Uh -huh. So it's really interesting. Maybe a little darker the than the other. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. <laughs> uh, you can't see my my video feed, but I was rolling my eyes. At <laughs> um, so uh, we have some uh, good questions. Um, uh, one uh, is how thick is the ice layer on Europa, uh, um, specifically compared to the water layer? Like uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that the ratio off the top of my head, but the ice layer I think is about uh, like 15 kilometers thick. It's pretty, pretty thick. Um, and the, the global ocean is going to be a lot thicker than that, but uh, well, it is pretty is massive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, so 15 kilometers, so your answer. Um, so, uh, question... Uh, uh, from Kevin Garcia, uh, Nerd Night speaker alumnus, um, wh why is it, or uh, are there theories on why one polar cap would be different in size from the other? Uh, and he he mentions on Mars, but that's actually true on Earth and in other places too. Why why is one uh, larger than the other? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, on Earth, a, a big reason for that is that Antarctica just is bigger, so it's going to remain bigger because it's going to cool down that uh, that pole a lot. Um, uh, it's going to cool down that pole more. Uh, also, on Earth, we have uh, ocean circulation, which plays a large role in that. Uh, Antarctica is surrounded by its own circumpolar current, uh, and so ocean water that reaches Antarctica is going to be a lot different than what we see in Greenland. And, and ocean dynamics on this planet play a large role in in controlling the size of those ice sheets um, and uh, on Mars, that has a lot to do, I, I think it's similar to what we see on Earth, like uh, it, there was more ice, so more ice is going to remain there uh, due to temperature changes. Uh, also, the uh, obliquity changes on Mars and the wind patterns are also going to play a really large role in that as well. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, so, is the shrinking ice sheet uh, on Earth uh, kind of a boon for geologists? As bad as it is in some ways, does it uh, also make uh, the science easier as it recedes and shows more? Right. Data? So I, I think I'm going to take that question as 
as we lose ice, does that help us study the ice sheet more? Uh, yeah. Go, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose um, it's, it's easier to get to certain places maybe, but um, absolutely glaci glaciologists and geologists are, are not ecstatic that the, the Greenland ice sheet is melting. Um, I will say it makes the science move a lot faster uh, and it's made the field grow really quickly. Uh, actually, glaciology is, is, is relatively new uh, compared to the rest of the sciences because we, we didn't really start caring about the ice sheets until we really started noticing how quickly that they were receding and melting. Uh, and so it brought together a lot of people from physics, from math, uh, from geology, and, and they were able to come together and quickly solve some of these problems. So over the past two decades, we have a lot of knowledge that we didn't have about the ice sheets before. So I think it's, I think it's making people move a lot faster, um, maybe not necessarily um, in, a, in a good way. <laughs> hmm. well, we have a, a question uh, sort of related to glaciology, more meteorology. Um, do you know of any work being done on non-water snow, like on planets that have a lot of CO2 ice or methane ice? Do they have CO2 snow or methane snow? Yeah, so I'm absolutely not an expert in this, but uh, I know that's really important on Mars. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, CO2 sublimates uh, out of the sublimates on the surface of the planet, so I don't think it actually precipitates CO2 snow, but that sort of atmospheric circulation of CO2 is massively important, and you know, that's going to be very different than uh, water and uh, I don't know off the top of my head other planets that actually snow different types of materials, but I, I guarantee you there's there's people working on that for sure. Mm -hmm. Wow, that that's a really interesting question. I, that was a really yeah, that's a really yeah, interesting uh, question. Uh, now, now I I want to know the answer and yeah, <laughs> a, a whole new um, uh, what would you call it exo meteorology? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We need a, another nerd night speaker now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll put out the call. Well, that's all the questions we have. And Sophie, thank you so much for a wonderful.